Welcome in to another episode of Your Drone Questions Answered. I'm your host, Chris Breedlove here with Drone Launch Academy. Today, our question is this, how can spray drones be used for treating golf courses? So to help me answer that question today, I'm really excited to have Craig Hare from Neptune Turf Solutions, as well as a new company, Aerial Drone Dynamics. Craig, thanks so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me, Chris. So Craig, just to kind of set the stage, we kind of get into the specifics of, of how spray drones can be used for golf courses. Would you tell our folks, our listeners about your background and how, how you kind of got to this point with your business? Absolutely. I kind of grew up in the golf business. My dad was a golf course superintendent and I became one for a few years, about five years, and then actually went on the sales road and saw many golf courses. And in 2008, I actually started my own company, uh, Neptune Turf Solutions, and started contract spraying with a John Deere 300 gallon sprayer and quickly realized that it's not as efficient as I would like it to be. And then kind of moved to some of the GPS technology that I'll put on there and kind of see that that was, is the future. So kind of delving into spray drones, been playing around with it for six months and definitely feel like that's the way everyone needs to go and uh, should be that way. So we're trying to figure it all out. And just to clarify it for our listeners, so this is like an emerging offering you're you're preparing right now, right, to offer at your company, navigating the process. We'll get into some of that process and the regulatory, let's say, not hurdles, but, you know, the steps that have to be completed. But but before we go there, Craig, so take me through this. So, and I worked at a golf course in high school. I was just a grunt. I didn't get to spray anything. I wasn't, you know, trained up. I would rake bunkers and those sorts of things. But in sort of just golf course management in general, um, I guess and not to go way into the weeds, you know, pun intended, but like, what are the different reasons folks are even spraying, regardless of the method of delivery, you know, whether it's fungicide or fertilizer, just kind of take us through really quickly, all those different sort of avenues, I guess, of why you would spray on golf course. Definitely uh, insects, fungus, and there's all kinds of sorts of things and fertilizers that these guys on golf courses are highly specialized and well-trained and have spent a lot of time working towards having what everybody expects is the perfect golf course. There's only maybe one that we can think of that's that way, and probably everybody knows what that is. But it's a highly specialized tool that these guys have to have to basically do their job, and a lot of golfers expect a lot, let's put it that way, in this day and age, more and more. So expect perfection, which is hard to achieve. Yeah, absolutely. So then along those lines, before we again kind of move towards the drone aspect here here in a few moments. So for your company, Neptune Turf Solutions, like where does, as the golf superintendent and their own staff, where does what they're doing, I assume they're spraying a lot typically in-house versus where do they bring in a third party like yourself and your team? Like where does that line tend to be? Is it like peak high season when stuff is really spreading worse from a fungal, you know, when does that kind of enter in it? So basically I usually get called in first off for the smaller golf courses. They usually don't have the large sprayers or the technology to, to use something like that. Then basically the guys get real busy in the summertime or they may have a machine that's broke down. Those machines are very expensive and to get GPS on them with the accuracy is uh, way up there over a hundred thousand dollars for just one piece of equipment. So gotcha. So basically y'all kind of supplement either y'all are their external spray staff slash program slash hardware, or in other cases, it's like, Oh man, it's maybe quit holo club. Hey, Oh, something's gone down. PGA yep. showing up. We got to, we got to get on this problem or whatever, everything in between. Right. That's correct. So a lot of times, you know, a lot of people don't plan ahead. And when they have that emergency, I, I usually get the call. Hey, can you come tomorrow? So. Yeah, yeah, understood. Just to keep indexing for our listeners, this is something you're you're really digging into right now. I think you said you've got an Agris T40, correct? Will be your first spray drone of choice in your business. But as you're getting ready, and we'll get to the regulatory here in a moment, where do you see the spray drone fitting in as far as, okay, is it just a scale thing and pretty much anything, whether it's granular or actual liquid spray? Like, how do you see that part going? Is it certain, I guess, applications of certain types of product at certain times that you think fit better for the drone side or could it be pretty much anything? Yeah, that's a good question is most of the drones are, you know, they're not spraying the volume of water that some chemicals need. So it's not fit for everything. But with that being said, since it can spray and it can spread, it's fit to do a lot of the heavy work lifting that the big key to it, I think, is that, you know, there's not somebody riding on that thing that's getting sprayed or chemicals in their face. And, you know, I feel like that's a huge step that someone 
being safe with that is a it's a whole lot better than riding something that you're spraying. Absolutely. And then maybe the last thing we'll we'll touch on before we get in more to the process and all the you know part 137, of course part 107, all these different things, state level regulations. But especially with with the aerial delivery, is this like early morning at twilight when there's no play on the course? Can you come in with a drone and say, hey, no one's on the eighth fairway right now. Let's mobilize for five minutes and then back off the way that the normal ground-based applicators might be doing the same thing. Does it work the same or you have to do some different things as far as keeping drift and stuff away from players on the course? Well, you definitely have to do that. One of the things that we feel like this has to happen is the golf course needs to be closed when we do that, or maybe not closed, but no golfers out there. With the T40, we have the ability to spray at night if we need to. We have tried that. It's a little different. There's no doubt about it, <laughs> but... Um, once yeah, it's sure. everything's mapped out there and the drone does what it's supposed to do. So you take the human error out of it and the human exposure out of it. That's the big key. Yep. So Craig, and I guess you're obviously in North Carolina. I'm in North Carolina and pesticide application, forget the aerial part. That is a state by state scenario, right? As far as licensure and regulation. So that, that is through. correct. You know, the state offers uh, classes and there's examination and you have to have a license to spray in each individual category, whether it be turf grass or right of ways or farms or any of that sort. So it's all specialized. Yeah. So when you add the aerial component to that, like for someone maybe who's listening to this, say, hey, like I am an experienced turf grass manager. You know, I've got my state of, could be North Carolina, could be other state, right? I've got my licensure, my, my business does. What extra components? I know there's a state-by-state -state component as well as, of course, the FAA, but how's that process been and what are all those steps? I know it's confusing, but <laughs> what are those steps that you have to jump through and how have you navigated that? to this point? Well, I started about a year ago, actually over a year ago, got my 107 to begin with, then the process of getting your federal 137, which is the ability to spray, I think they word it as economic poisons is the way yeah. that federal Good people term. use it, yeah. uh, which is kind of a, you know scary in that sense. But after I've gotten that, then uh, the your equipment has to be registered and checked out. And then you also have to have, at the state level, aerial methods of applying, which I am in the process of getting now. So as far as I know, I'm actually a class three medical. You have to be checked out physically, mentally, that you can fly and distribute economic poisons. Yeah. So to make sure I'm understanding, Craig, is it basically everyone knows listening to this, that part 107 is like that minimal baseline that anyone doing anything with the drone, of course, for commercial purposes, have to have the part 107 certificate. The part 137, like you said, that's still from the FAA side of things. That's a blanket necessity. This On the state level front, would you say that as an experienced, like very experienced turf grass manager or anyone else maybe who's had the ornamental or whatever their different licenses are, did you find that, and I guess you're still in that process, does that seem to kind of build in a pretty logical way on what you're already used to from just, let's say, normal spraying? Or was there a whole like brand new world of different terms and, and components and just things to learn? Was it like, wow, this is a brave new world? Like, ah, I already kind of know how this works. It's just not a hose. It's now... It's now flying. Well, I would say the spraying part is, you know, I've been doing it for 40 years, pretty much since 1986 when I graduated from NC State. And after, I mean, the process, obviously the federal process is uh, a little different. Pretty much the North Carolina process, I'm still talking to a bunch of the extension people, but they're all new to it also. So it is a learning curve. I think we're all going through like I said, and a lot of the regulations from the 137, the 107, the 44807, there's a lot of steps. You know, basically I'm flying a drone. It doesn't say I have to have seat belts on this thing, so I'm not on it. There's a lot of that ambiguity for all of these processes. And like you said a few moments ago, like the part 137 is not about unmanned. It's just about aerial spraying. It's like you said, there's probably a lot of stuff that's just not applicable, but you probably still have to know that to pass the test, and that can make things a little... That's correct. Now, something else you just said, Craig, so... And I, I, I suspect that pretty much every state at this point has some version, or maybe they're all called extension agents, cooperative extension. But is it fair to say that your relationships with folks at NC Cooperative Extension have been critical for you navigating this process on the state level? Uh, absolutely. You know, a lot of those guys, I, we all lean on, we have questions and they're great guys, but a lot of them don't know either. There's the question, I'm still going through the process. And when I ask one question, one person says one thing, another says another, but I feel like they know it's the future. It's coming. They're trying to streamline it. They're asking a lot of questions about how, you know, not many people have spray drones, obviously, yet. I mean, obviously, you're in that business. You're hoping there's going to be a, a bunch in the future, and I feel like it's going to be so. 
Yeah. So maybe another big regulatory question, Craig, within the FAA side of things, right? Like normal part 107, let's say if I was on your crew, I can't fly without your presence, right? I could fly under your part 107 if you're standing right next to me. That's correct. I also know that from what I recall back in the day, it's not like every single person who works maybe for you or for the golf course has to have their pesticide applicator license. It's more like the business. How does that work though when it comes to aerial spraying? Does each staff member that you employ who's going to fly, let's say your T40, do they all have to hold all of this? Or can you as the business owner hold the license and it sort of carries through to your staff? As far as I know, you have to be there on site You have to be able to take over the controller the way I understand it. So if there is an emergency, if somebody's flying it, the person with the license has to be able to take the controller and take over, whether it be a second controller or the controller that's being used. So just to be clear, let's say you as the part 137 holder, let's say you got five folks, they all got the part 107. But if none of them have their part 137, you as the part 137 holder must be there to to intervene. You have to be there within arm's reach, basically. Yep. Understood. So what about somebody, maybe, maybe folks listening to this, many are already very experienced drone pilots, you know, navigating FAA stuff isn't so difficult. Do you see an opportunity, maybe even for yourself or someone in your shoes, or could you see a scenario where someone who isn't an experienced pilot might be able to partner with someone like yourself, bring that knowledge to the fore? They might not know anything about, Hey, well, which fungicide and this and that, but kind of learn from someone like you and really partner together. Does that seem like an opportunity for for other commercial drone pilots out there, you think? I definitely think so. Obviously, you got to have the equipment, which none of that is inexpensive by no means. It's not like you go out and buy a Walmart and get a drone and go spray. So they are expensive, difficult to, and to go through the process. is time-consuming. It's almost t- taking me a year just yeah. to try to get to where I can have a business. And I'm still not there, but I'm working on it. So. Yeah. Absolutely. I will have to say that, and the reason I contacted you is, you know, not necessarily spraying, but being able to use some of the newer technology with NDVI and in the future of, I believe that we'll be able to identify weeds from a drone and maybe just go spot spray. So I kind of think that's the future. Absolutely. And that's even something on this podcast before I began hosting it, I think it was last year, maybe last two years, they did that very, you know, that whole topic and a little bit of a deeper dive. But to your point, it's really closing that whole loop, right? Doing multispectral analysis is great. I think a lot of times now, now again, in maybe monoculture agriculture, there's more of that being done. You know, prescribing. Right. I think the really fascinating part of what you're doing is you're doing this on golf courses specifically. Again, not closed environments. I mean, I mean, you could close the course, but it's a lot of people maybe coming and going, playing, maybe walking their dogs, if it's that kind of you know that kind of thing. So that to me is a really fascinating kind of next step. To all of this, but let me ask one more question, Craig, before I let you go. So is the workflow, like you mentioned earlier in this conversation, the superintendent knows, hey, it's about that time for this or that application, but our equipment's down or we're getting overwhelmed or, but like, otherwise, is this generally kind of a reactive approach of like, hey, it's about that time. Are we doing like a, you know, growing degree days and saying, hey, we should go ahead and put this down like a pre-emergent. Is it all of the above? Do you see with the drone side, it might be a little bit less reactive, more of the, hey, let's do like scheduled monitoring, whether that's the golf course themselves. And then they bring in you with the spray drone, or maybe you offer that yourself as the scouting plus the application. That's a good question. Is that, you know, most of these guys are trying to plan ahead and preemptive strike, I guess is the best way I'd put it. Pre-emerge, you know, preemptive for fungicides and insecticides. If I get the call, then usually it's an emergency. Right. No, I hear you. Okay. That's awesome. And again, just to kind of wrap this up now, it seems like an emerging opportunity here. Yes, there's extra layers of regulation as well. There should be, right? From the chemical side, the economic poison, that's kind of an <laughs> interesting term, but it, but is. it is. It really is. So thank you for the time, man. Neptune Turf Solutions is your, your main business. You've got aerial drone dynamics is kind of coming online. If folks want to reach out to you to talk about this process more, maybe compare notes, maybe partner, maybe, maybe they're a golf course super. What's the best way for them to reach out to you? You can reach me at my email, which is craighair4 at gmail.com, which is C-R-A-I-G-H-A-I-R-E, the number four at gmail.com. Perfect. We'll make sure if you're comfortable, put that in the show notes as well or whichever other links and things you might want folks to to access you on. So Craig, again, thank you so much for the time. And folks, as always, if you got a question like this attack on this podcast, please go to ydqa.io or drop me a line at chris at dronelaunchacademy.com. Thanks for listening. Have a great week.